yesterday we just began this, this passage. It's a very difficult passage. I can't explain all of it. I don't know how to explain all of it. Um, I'm picking out the pieces that I have some understanding of. Um, this is the dialogue at the burning bush where God tells Moses, I want you to go down to play a role in the liberation of the Jewish people from Egypt. And Moses has a raft of objections. The oral tradition says that this discussion, debate, went on for a week. So on 303, God says, it's my people in Egypt, and they're suffering, and I promised to give them the land of Israel. So now go and um, be my agent to engineer the exodus from Egypt. Now, verse 11 at the bottom of the page. I'm going to change the translation a little bit because the English translator, for the sake of the English reader, adds in things that aren't there in Hebrew. Um, Moses replied to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and should take the children of Israel out of Egypt. There's no repetition of the I in Hebrew. It's not necessary in the Hebrew, not really necessary in the English either, and there's no repetition of the I. And it makes a difference because the first half of his statement stresses his own Inappropriateness. I'm not appropriate for the job. The second half doesn't stress that he's not appropriate for the job. It doesn't stress anything, really. But it could be understood as saying that the job has a problem. Not that I have a problem in doing it, but the job has a problem. That is one acceptable way to read it. And that is the way the rabbinic tradition reads it. And that is the way it then understands the answer. I, I wouldn't say it's the only way to read it, but it's one acceptable way to read it. So first of all, I'm going to go to Pharaoh. I'm going to stand in front of the king, who's really an emperor or an empire. I'm going to be the one to broker this liberation. It's not me. And second of all, the project is taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. What's the logic behind that? Why should they be liberated? Do they have any merit? Have they earned it? Are they such uh, exemplary, righteous people that God can't tolerate their being slaves? What's the logic behind the project as a whole, whether or not I'm the one to play the role of agent? So God answers him both questions. He said, first of all, I shall be with you. You're right. You are not a competent agent to do this. And I wouldn't send you to do it alone. You're going to be my spokesman, and I'm going to be behind you, and I'll provide you with the instruments that are necessary to make it a success. I agree with your complaint, and I'm answering you directly. And this is your sign that I have sent you. When you take the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. The tradition understands this as an answer to the second question. You want to know what the logic is in the project? You ask, what merit does the Jewish people have to be taken out of Egypt? What reason is there in their present condition justifying this project? Answer, there is none. There is none. My engineering the liberation of the Jewish people from Egypt is an investment in their future. There's nothing in their past that would justify it. Even though in the previous page it says they're suffering, that wouldn't be reason enough. Even though they're slaves, that wouldn't be reason enough. I'm investing in their future. They're going to serve me on this mountain, and the service, in fact, on this mountain is to receive the Torah, the mountain of Sinai. Now, this statement has a lot of large-scale implications. I'm sure you're aware how the international Jewish community, accepting, except for the Orthodox, market Pesach and Hanukkah to the world. 
This is the Jewish people's invention of the idea of personal liberty and rights. That everyone has freedom of conscience and freedom of operation. Tyranny is not tolerated. A spectacular, miraculous freeing of slaves from slavery. Well, it doesn't wash. First of all, the, ancient, the, the Jewish God, I hope this isn't news, the Jewish God is the only God of the whole universe. So that being the case, slavery as it was practiced throughout the entire world, if it's an outrage to the creator, should have called forth a response more than once. Number two, if you talk about political freedom and autonomy, the majority of the history of the Jewish people doesn't have freedom and autonomy. So the commitment to Jewish freedom isn't absolute either. There's no source for the idea of political freedom and rights and self-determination and autonomy in Jewish sources. Jewish sources take seriously that there's a creator of the universe who revealed his will to Jewish people and to all of mankind in varying degrees, and that fulfilling his will is the top value of life. And if you just happen to prefer cheeseburgers, too bad. And if you happen to prefer to worship Zeus and Minerva and other, you know, and Baal and Ashtart, too bad. The creator of the universe outlaws that. But here you have a text that describes it directly. Why is God investing in freeing the Jewish people? Not because they're slaves. That's not the reason. The reason is, having gone through this slavery experience and then being freed in the way that they're going to be freed, qualifies them, prepares them for the commitment of accepting the Torah at Sinai, and that is the reason why they are being freed. This is encapsulated in the last paragraph of the Shema, which we say at least twice a day, and if you get further into it, it'll be more often. Uh, if you take a look on page 819, now this paragraph is a paragraph of Tzitzis. What are we doing saying that twice a, week, twice a day? So the Gemara says, because we are commanded to remember the exodus from Egypt twice a day. And one could be forgiven for asking, this is a paragraph in the book of Numbers. Okay, the last sentence does describe the exodus from Egypt. It does. That just, it does. But you have a whole book of exodus. If you were told you have to remember the exodus from Egypt twice a day, and you were asked to pick a, 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 a sample text, wouldn't you have looked in the book of Exodus to find a text about the Exodus, to remember the Exodus? Why would you jump to the book of Numbers for a whole paragraph about Tzitzis, only one of whose sentences deals with the Exodus from Egypt? But look what it says. 41. I am Hashem, your God, who has removed you from the land of Egypt to be a God unto you. This verse describes the purpose of the Exodus. Not just the fact of the Exodus, but the purpose of the Exodus. The purpose was not to punish the Egyptians for their evil of enslaving people or to compensate you for your period of slavery and all the rest. No. I did it as part of a process to solidify a relationship of, God, of being your God. Now that's the lesson in the two verses that we just looked at on page 305. Now, back to the top of 305. <coughs> Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your forefathers has sent me to you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? The commentators here are, I think, quite justifiably mystified by the statement. Maimonides mentions it in the guide and others. Let's consider the scenario that Moses is proposing. I'm going to go down to Egypt. I'm going to tell them, the God of your ancestors appeared to me and told me to rescue you from Egypt. They're going to say, oh, really? What is his name? <laughs> Why would they say that? What are they after? Well, let's see. What are Moses' options? If they say to him, what is his name? Either he'll, get, he'll give them a name that they know, or he'll give them a name they don't know. If he gives them a name that they know, so they know it, and he knows it, then it's a name that they know. If he gives them a name they don't know, so then... It's not genuine, it's doubtful. How can Moses anticipate the scenario where the 
question Moses is putting in their mouth is a nonsensical question. It's a question that can't lead to any clarification, any verification, nothing. What is Moses anticipating? Now, Maimonides has a very philosophical understanding of the question and how to answer it. I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to tell you the Kabbalistic answer. The Kabbalistic answer is this. God is, in some sense or other, infinite. And being infinite, it means he is beyond your all human capacity to understand. How shall God act in the world? If he acts out of his infinity, then what he does will be to us pure chaos. It'll be a black box issuing random events. We won't be able to understand anything at all. God doesn't want that kind of interaction. God wants a relationship of understanding. So God makes two moves. Number one, he creates human minds with a certain ability to understand according to certain patterns. And then God resolves to interact with the world on the whole, though there are exceptions, but on the whole, according to those patterns, so human beings can understand what's going on. He doesn't have to do that in terms of his own essence, but because he has chosen to have this kind of relationship with people whom he's created, that's how he implements that choice. Every interaction has its own mode of, you might call it, step down of the electric voltage to be a, in a pattern that we can understand. And different types of interactions have different types of step down. And it is a valid question. In each particular case, what kind of mode is God using in this particular interaction? What is the character of the category he's using to interact with us? This principle enables us to understand quite a number of passages, which otherwise, I won't even say people have difficulty understanding, but people have tripped over them over and over again. Um, take a look on page... 17. This is after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 8, top of the page. They heard the sound of Hashem God manifesting itself in the garden. I'll change that translation in a minute. Toward evening, and the man and his wife hid from Hashem God among the trees of the garden. And here, the naive academic critic, that might be redundant, says, um, did they think that they could hide from the creator of the universe? Must be that we're describing a very primitive stage of the development of Hebrew thought where God is grandpa in the sky and he might, you know, be sleepy or uh, his eyes are dim and he hasn't got his glasses with him and uh, maybe you could hide, you know, this is very primitive, childish theology. Well, verse 9, Hashem God called out to man and said to him, where are you? So then what's God do? Why doesn't God say, Dope! I'm the creator of the universe. You're hiding from me? Where are you? Grow up! Oh, God, so to speak, plays along with it. Why would he do that? And I'll show you in a moment that not only does God play along with this. Now let's go back to the translation. In 8, the translator writes, manifesting itself. But the word in Hebrew is strolling. This alech means to stroll. The translator is describing the impact, but the literal world is to stroll. They heard the sound of Hashem strolling in the, uh, in the garden. Strolling is a localized effect. So their interpretation is every interaction with the creator of the universe is an infinite step down. He steps down to a certain finite category so that we can appreciate and understand the interaction. If he's manifesting himself locally, of course he knows where we are. But if he's manifesting himself locally, he's not going to use that knowledge so we can hide. And they're right, because he doesn't use that knowledge. He calls out to them, where are you? Because that's the quality of interaction that God has chosen. And he waits for them to present themselves, which then, being confronted with, the, with God's question, where are you? They think better of hiding and decide to present themselves. Same thing happens on 21. Famous story of Cain and Abel. 
There's a certain competition between them. And Cain kills Abel. Verse 9. Hashem said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the same question in the minds of the academic critics arises here. Does Cain think he can lie to the creator of the universe? Sure, because the creator of the universe is granddad in the sky who forgets from time to time. Okay, fine. Leave that for nine-year-olds. No, they're Jewish kids. Seven-year-olds. But God asks Cain. He asks him, where is Abel? So Cain says, aha, what kind of interaction is this? This is an interaction where God is not using his knowledge of where, where uh, Abel is. Then I can lie. Of course he knows, but he's not using that knowledge. Now at this point, God, so to speak, double crosses Cain. And he says to him, Ten, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out from the ground. So of course God knows the answer. Of course he knows the answer. The question is whether he's going to use his knowledge or not. This time, God overrules what Cain thinks is the category and operates out of a different category. But this, by the way, shows you that if God asks a question, you shouldn't infer he doesn't know the answer. That's dreadfully naive. Think about your own life. Don't you often ask questions to which you know the answer? Sure you do. Sometimes you do it to test someone. What do you think the best route of energy spread of dispersal is for this, for this project? Ask somebody who's studying energy dispersal. Or you ask, you say for emphasis, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you doesn't mean, I can't remember if I told you or didn't. Tell me, did I tell you? No, didn't I tell you that I told you and didn't you, debate? you didn't get the point? And if we do it in normal human interaction, why can't God do it? Okay, this is over and over and over again. Now, back on page 305, the Kabbalistic understanding of Moses' worry is this. He says, I'm going to come to Egypt, and I'm going to tell them that the God of their ancestors has appeared to me, and he's going to rescue them from Egypt. They're going to ask, what is the quality of this interaction? What, kind, what category does this interaction come from? And the category will make a difference as to how they should prepare for it and how they should deal with it. I'll give you just two examples of possibilities. One is that the Egyptians are being punished for the fact that they... Uh, victimize the Jews. If that's the project, then the Jews don't have to earn it. They don't have to earn it. The Egyptians are going to be punished, and uh, the Jewish freedom will just be the byproduct. If it's mercy for the Jews, then it has to be earned. Mercy has to be earned. Mercy isn't obvious. Mercy can't be taken for granted. And then it'll make a gigantic difference how the Jews should prepare themselves for this interaction. So, God, so Moses says to God, when I go there, they're going to ask me, what kind of event is this? What category is liberation coming from? What shall I tell them? That's a legitimate, meaningful question. So, Hashem answers him with three answers. Okay, so you see, the English translates in 14, Hashem answered Moses. In Hebrew, there's no word, the, the verb for answer is not used. In context, it's correct. The Hebrew word is said, but Moses asked the question, and, Moses, and, and God is, is, speaks back, so in context, it could be understood that way, but it's not a literal translation. So he says, I shall be as I shall be. What kind of category is that? How does that describe the upcoming liberation. What's the, what's the theme that's expressed by I shall be as I shall be? The theme is, it's for me. It's not mercy on the Jews. It's not punishment for the Egyptians. I have a plan for the universe, and I'm making it happen. It's not dependent upon local conditions. That's one answer that he gives. Then he says, so shall he say to the children of Israel, I shall be has sent me to you. That's half of the first one. God said further to Moses, so shall he say to the children of Israel, Hashem, the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has dispatched me to you. This is my name forever. This is my remembrance from generation to generation. So God is telling Moses at least that there are two different themes in this event. Two different themes. It's not a single theme event. It's complex. 
One is, I have a plan for the universe, and this is a necessary step, and nothing in the conditions is going to prevent this from happening. Number two, I'm doing this as the God of the ancestors of the Jewish people. Now, these two manifest themselves in different aspects of the event. When, for example, the, at the Red Sea, there are mountain ranges on, parallel, on, on opposite sides, and at the far end is the sea, and in the gap between the mountains, the Egyptian army is bearing down on the Jews, and the Jews are in despair, and they are praying to God, and Moses is praying to God, and God tells him, don't pray, so there's a number of comments that are made about that, but one of the comments is, don't pray, this isn't dependent upon prayer. You'll falsify the event if you make it dependent upon prayer. I'm going to save you, and I'm going to drown the Egyptians, not because you deserve it, not because of mercy, not because you asked for it. I'm doing it out of this identification. I am, I shall be as I shall be. It's part of my plan for the universe. And if you pray, and it looks as if I'm responding to your prayer, you're falsifying the, na the, the nature of the event. That's an instance in the process where the first answer plays its role. And an instance where the second plays its role is epitomized by a midrash, and as I'll show you, the Gaon of Vilna uses to explain certain aspects of events. In the days of darkness, the midrash says 80% of the Jewish population that was in Egypt died. Died, were buried, and they did not participate in the exodus. Why? Because even after eight plagues, they weren't ready to go. They didn't get the message. They could not be regarded as representing the patriarchs in that generation. The commitment to save the Jewish people is not a commitment to their biology, to their DNA, to their ancestry as registered in the registry of families. It's a commitment to their spiritual identity. And that being the case, after eight plagues, these people are still not ready to identify themselves as representing the tradition from the patriarchs, then my commitment to the patriarchs says God doesn't apply to them. And they're not going out. So that's where a, uh, the second message that Moses gave to them, you want to know what kind of an event this is? There's an event as a fruition of the promise that God gave to the patriarchs. And that carries the implication, either you represent them or you don't. Now, it says in, later in the process that, that the, the servitude was greatly increased and they cried out to God. The Gaon of Illness says it's because of this principle. The saving is going to happen to those who represent the patriarchs. They're slaves. They're suffering. Okay. In what way does this show that they represent the patriarchs? So God engineers that the servitude should be more intense to the point where they can't stand it, to the point where they're forced to cry out. And when they cry out to the God of their patriarchs, they then identify themselves as representing the patriarchs, and then they're worthy of being saved. So the increase in the servitude, which locally, if you take a look at it from the point of view of one or two months, looks like a terrible evil that they have to suffer, really becomes the engine of being able to save them. And all that comes out of the idea that here, God is telling Moses to describe to them the nature of the process that's going to be taking place. Are we together? God says to Moses, here's the plan, go to the elders and tell them that I've sent you. I'm going to bring them up to the land. And at 18, God says to Moses, now, I'm going to change the translation here because, as you'll see, they make a mistake here. They translate two different Hebrew phrases the same way. They will listen to your voice. Heed, in English, indicates obedience. The Hebrew here is v'shamata, v'shamu lekolecha. Shamu lekol means they will listen to your voice. You and the elders should come to the king and say to him, X, Y, Z, Skip to chapter 4 in the next page. Moses responded and said, but they will not believe me and they will not heed my voice, but they will say Hashem did not appear to you. 
Now, if you read it in English, English says, God says to Moses, Q, and Moses is back, not Q, which is really quite bold, even for Moses, to simply, you know, throw it back in God's face. You say Q, no, it's wrong. Q is not right. But it's not true. In the Hebrew, it's not the same phrase. Moses' phrase in the Hebrew is Lo yishmu bikoli. And God's phrase is Bishamu Likolecha. Bishamu Likolecha means they'll listen to you. Moses' phrase is they won't obey me. Maybe not. Maybe not. God didn't promise they'll obey. God just promised that they'll listen. And Moses is complaining they won't obey. So, okay. Now, comes a passage. Now, I may have done this for some of you, but I think there are some of you that I haven't done it, and it's really uh, quite important. So he's claiming, Moses is saying now, when I come and present all of this information to them, they're not going to believe. Shem said to him, what is it that is in your hand? He said, a, sna- a staff. He cast it on the ground. He came to the ground and became a snake. Moses fled from it. Hashem said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp its tail. He stretched out his hand and grasped it tightly. And it became a staff in his palm. So that they shall believe that Hashem, the God of the forefathers, appeared to you, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Hashem said, yes, further to him, bring your hand into your bosom. He brought his hand into his bosom. He withdrew it and behold, his hand was leprous, like snow. He said, return your hand to your bosom. He returned it to his bosom. He took it out. And behold, it reverted to be like his flesh. God speaking again, it shall be that if they do not believe you and do not heed the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall be that if they do not believe even these two signs and do not heed your voice, then you shall take from the water of the river and pour it out on the dry land. And the water that you take from the river shall become blood when it is on the dry land. Okay. There is a giant problem here. You could infer the problem just from what we read, or you could infer the problem equally from a, a little bit, well, the two different parts of what we read. Let me read, give you the gist again and see if you can figure out the problem. This is a problem in straight logic. Moses says to God, when I get down there in Egypt and I tell them the God of their ancestors appeared to me and it's going to be an exodus, they're not going to believe it. God says to Moses, what do you have in your hand? Staff, throw it down. Throw it down, becomes a snake. Oh, it runs away. Pick it up, becomes a staff. Put your hand into your garment, take it out. Leopards, put it back in. Right. That's going to convince them. And if by chance it doesn't convince them, then pour out water from the, from the river, it'll become blood. Isn't there a disconnect here between the problem and the solution? What's the problem and what is being present, presented as a solution? Again, the problem is when I get there, six weeks from now, I'm making up the time, six weeks from now, they won't believe me. How shall I convince them that it's true? God's answer. What do you have in your hand? Staff, throw it, throw it down. Throw it down, it comes a snake. What question do you want to ask? Well, so that's supposed to help the uh, people of Israel when the needs to frame right there and right there. I think you're right, but I would ask it maybe even more pointed. What should have happened? Should have done it for them, for the people. Right. And, and if, but Moses is asking now. He's weeks away from arriving there. He's asking now, what should God have done? So I'll do it then. Right. God should have said, you know what, when you go, I have three spectacular tricks for you to perform. When you get there, you'll throw your staff down and become a snake. When you get there, you put your hand in your garment and become leprous. Just like the third one, which in fact he doesn't do in front of Moses now. And he says, when you get there, you'll pour out the water and it'll become blood. He should have done that with the first two. Why is he doing it here in the wilderness? So the Ramban, whose commentary I'm going to quote now, starts by pointing out that there's a rabbinic comment here. And this is a good example of how a rabbinic comment, which to the naive academic, and as I said, that's probably redundant, sounds like just moralizing and the rabbis exercising their imaginations, turns out to be based on the text. The rabbis say that 
God did these two in front of him in order to punish Moses for slandering the Jewish people. And the snake in the Garden of Eden slandered God. And leprosy is a divine punishment for slander, or Lashon Hara. So both of them are used here to teach Moses a lesson. Now, the naive academic critic reads that and says, oh, that's the rabbis who are moralizing, just hanging it on the text as an, as an excuse to teach uh, moral lessons. But no, there's a problem in the text. The logic of the text is, is, is unclear. And if you add in what the rabbis say, then the, the text has a logic. Again, I wouldn't say it's the only way to understand it. And in fact, the Ramban adds an, an, a different understanding. But when the rabbis make a comment, there's always something in the text that provokes the comment. Not just imagination and moralizing. The Ramban says, Moses, hearing it directly from God, his heart is not completely satisfied. His heart is not completely tranquil. And it takes two to settle his heart. That's why God does two and not three. He doesn't need the third one. This expresses a principle of Jewish psychology, which there are many other instances of in the Torah itself. Yes, Hashem, I'll show you. And which informs Jewish practice. Knowing something intellectually, with clarity, and without doubt, does not control your emotions and does not control your actions. It is possible for a person to act against what he knows to be right, even right for himself, even beneficial for himself. People are not capable of shooting themselves in the foot. That means that in ancient Greek philosophy, it is Plato who fails to express the Jewish idea and Aristotle who expresses the Jewish idea. Aristotle wrote about weakness of the will, where a person can know clearly what needs to be done, even for his own benefit, even his own reasonably immediate benefit, and yet fail to do it. You probably, as students, have had experience with this type of behavior. I hope not your own, but other people whom you've observed. It's called not studying for the exam till the night before. You've probably heard that some students do that and then get worse grades than they otherwise could have gotten. And it happens semester after semester. And each time the student says, I know it's wrong, and I know I'm shooting myself in the foot, and I could do better, and I'll get a better job and earn more money. And then uh, you know, the party comes up, and he drinks a beer. And blah, 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 it's the night before, and he's taking caffeine tablets, and he's, you know, and instead of getting an A, he gets a B. If he's lucky. Or he gets a C or a D. We are capable of shooting ourselves in the foot. This is what the Ramban says is going on here when God does the two and not the third. Are we together? Okay, now I also want to point out something to you. I, I probably mentioned to some of you that in the rabbinic tradition, like any literature, you have to know the style of the literature. And I have mentioned that uh, in the rabbinic tradition, the literature presents statements that sound like they are absolute and universal, and it's pretty fair to say that they're never absolute and universal. There are always exceptions. Um, even one of the great Talmudic sages, Rabbi Yochanan, states this as, as a kind of rule. He says, every general statement has exceptions. Even a general statement that lists exceptions will have other exceptions. Hmm. That's not a mistake. It's not sloppiness. That's the style of the literature. There are many, many examples of that. Now, I've been teaching this for 40 years. Just a few years ago, it began to occur to me that the written, the written text is like that as well. The written Torah is like that as well. Only we read it and we read the commentaries and we already understand how to make it work so we don't stop to register that, in fact, that's what's going on. Now look what we just read. Um, look at verse 8. It shall be that if they do not believe you, do not heed the voice of the first sign, they will Believe the voice of the latter sign. And then it says, And it shall be that if they do not believe even these two signs, then the careful reader who's paying attention to the surface should say, What? Wait a minute, you just said they will. What do you mean they don't? It's a straight contradiction within two, ten words. But that's the way the text expresses itself. 
What the text means is, this is what should happen. It's normal, it's expected, it's valid. But I'm not giving you an absolute prediction. So therefore, in nine, I'm stating the possible exception. What is the absolute prediction? Sorry? Who wants to provide an absolute prediction? I'm not understanding. Who wants? Well, why not just provide an absolute prediction and say you need these three and do them in order? Uh, because you then don't get the implication that there is some kind of gigantic failure if the first two don't work. Well, just, just explain. Most people will... Well, that's, it's, done, it's done here, and it's done much shorter than what you're suggesting. No, it could be shorter than... I'm, I'm doing it long, but it seems like there's... It seems like the way it's worded seems... I don't know. It, 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 I don't like the way it's worded, personally. Correct, because you're reading it with an English literature background. And I, if you would read let's say, a thousand pages of our tradition, you get used to it, and then you understand it right away. So the Hebrew, the Hebrew wording is more concise? No. The, the literature as a whole is, read, is, is written that way. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly. There's an example where it talks about whether there'll be poor people in the land, and within eight verses, there's an absolute contradiction. But the, the text does this. There's one verse that says... There will never be a total absence of uh, destitute people in the land. And the other verse says, You will not have any destitute people. So, of course, the, the oral tradition understands that it depends upon conditions. If you achieve such an ideal state of, of spirituality, then indeed there will be no impoverished people. And if not, there will be impoverished people. Right? You know that the predictions for the future dozens of times are made dependent upon our spiritual condition. So here, the contradiction is resolved in that way as part of the context of the, of the, of the literature. But this is, this is an example here of this is the same sort of thing. And it, I, when I started to appreciate it in the written text, I thought to myself, okay, so that's where the rabbis got it from. They're working with a written text that has this stylistic feature, so they took it over for themselves and also made a stylistic feature of the same, of the same, of the same thing. But it means every time you see what looks like the universal state, then in the back of your mind, you say, I wonder what the exceptions are. Yeah. Isn't, didn't Christianity do exactly that? They just did that same concept. They looked at the Chumash and they saw some verses about the covenant being eternal and the covenant will change and this and that, and they flipped it on itself and they said, well, it's not really only for the Jewish people. You can look at it this way, you can look at it that way. And then they expounded upon that with that same concept. Um, I wouldn't mind if they would use our methodology to try to derive their results. First of all, um, maybe this isn't surprising, but Judaism is not anti-Christianity. Judaism is Judaism. There are other religious traditions and philosophies which overlap with Judaism. If they overlap, more power to them. Where they disagree, they're wrong. We have no we have no interest in simply saying, it's Christian, it's got to be wrong, and we reject it for this and this reason. No, it could very well be right. But you can't take just two verses. You have to take the literature as a whole. Right? And you have to look and see whether there are what look to be contradictory verses. There aren't any verses that say that if the Jews do X, Y, Z, I violate my covenant with them. There aren't any verses like that. None. So then you don't have the written material to use to... to to impose this, this interpretive complex on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we reject that, that idea. Reject that they, they take it from the idea of a covenant, but it also says the covenant's eternal. It also says they'll, all, they'll exist, they'll exist in exile. It also says they'll return to the land of Israel. Right? So all of that, for us, is, since there are no contradictory verses, all of that is absolute. Mm -hmm. So it could have been done, but... Uh, right? um, to their, to their loss, they're not consistent in using our methodologies. As Rabbi Kellerman points out, he wrote some questions to the Pope and got answers from an author whom the Pope certifies. As we would say, he gives us a scum to his, to his, um, to his works um, about certain verses in the New Testament which are inconvenient from their point of view. And um, the answer from the post spokesman is basically, you're right, they're just impossible. I mean, he, interprets, he, he, he offers an opinion which means they're selling out on positions that they've been holding for 1,900 years. And as Rabbi Kellerman points out, we have an oral tradition. Our oral tradition goes all the way back to the beginning. 
they could have escaped my questions if they could say, we too have an oral tradition. The oral tradition explains that this is what this verse means and this has to be understood and so forth and so on. But they didn't do that because you can't make up an oral tradition that wasn't there. You can't do that. And that being the case, they were stuck. So but had they done that much earlier, then they could have avoided the problem. I mean, there are two contradictory genealogies of the founder of Christianity going back to David. So he asked them, which one's right? You know what the answer was? Neither one is right. They're both made up. The tr Jewish tradition says he's got to be descended from David, and so we just you know, made up names to indicate the fact that he's descended from David. Like, <laughs> okay, okay, but that's how you're describing your scriptures, right? Um, some places uh, put the resurrection in, in Jerusalem, and some put, them, put it in the Galil, in the Galilee. So he writes, which one is right? Answer is, we don't know. The disciples wrote it decades after the event, and they forgot where it was. So these, these disciples thought it was in, the, in Jerusalem. And it doesn't really matter where it was, right? I mean, the whole point is that he came back from the dead. So where it was geographically, that's not a matter of, of, uh, of concern. So, you know, you, you could have said uh, Jeru, uh, the, the Galilee was the physical place and Jerusalem was the spiritual meaning of the place. I mean, there are lots of things you could have done if you could imp import a, a, uh, a, uh, a, an oral tradition. There's the famous problem of the virgin birth. In the boy, verse in Isaiah, the word is Alma. Alma does not mean virgin. In Hebrew, Basula is virgin. Alma means young woman. And when they translate into Greek, the, the Christian scriptures were written in Greek. Not in Hebrew, not in Aramaic. They were written in Greek. They use the word Parthenos. And Parthenos can mean virgin. And that's where the whole doctrine of virgin birth came from. And for 1,900 years, they've been telling us that, this, that it's a virgin birth, right? So he wrote, by, he wrote to, to this question to the Pope. It's based on a mistranslation. Pope says, you're right, you're right. The truth is, it was never meant as a biological statement. Oh, no? That's one of the major miracles of the Christian life. It was never meant as a biological statement. Virgin birth was used in Greek mystery rites as a sign of purity. So the early Christian writers borrowed this from the Greek mystery rites as a symbol of the purity of the founder of Christianity. Okay, that's his answer. This, he wrote this oh, to the Pope 20 years ago. Oh, 20, oh, 20, 20, 20. This is Rabbi Lawrence Kellerman, who's teaching today. Oh, okay. right? You can see it in his book, uh, Permission to Receive. He has a, a summary of the, of the correspondence in the back. So, wow. yeah. Okay, we'll pick it up again tomorrow.